she was born in Germany. Europe was divided by religion and the English king needed support. Negotiations took place and portraits painted, but would they be honest in their depiction? A marriage that did more harm than good and some wives would never be the same again. We now look at the story of Anne of Cleves. On the 22nd of September 1515, a lady was born in the city of Dusseldorf in Germany. She was the second daughter of John III from the House of Lamarck, Duke of Ulrich, but he's often called the Duke of Cleves. His wife was Maria, who was the Duchess of Ulrichburg. Anne of Cleves had been initially influenced by the Dutch philosopher and Christian scholar Erasmus. He had come to the aid of the Schmalkaldic League, a military alliance of Lutheran princes who opposed Emperor Charles V. After her father's death, her brother William would now take hold of the reins, becoming Duke of Ulrich Clevesburg. In 1526, her sister Sybil would marry the head of the Protestant Confederation of Germany, John Frederick, a man considered the champion of the Reformation. At the age of 11, Anne found herself betrothed to a nine-year-old who was son and heir to Antoine, the Duke of Lorraine. It wouldn't be long later that this was cancelled and considered unofficial. However, due to ongoing disputes between her father and Charles V, it now seemed that this family would make great allies for England, especially after King Henry VIII had signed the Truce of Nice. A match was declared by Henry's minister, Thomas Cromwell, but it would take quite some time to convince the king himself as to how this would and should pan out. To find out more about this lady, Henry sent his court artist, Hans Holbein the Younger, to travel over and paint a portrait of her so the king could see precisely what he was letting himself in for. Henry stipulated that the image must be as accurate as possible. He wasn't in the mood for flattery. For Cromwell, this was a minor success. He had at least got the king to take some notice of this potential bride. By 1539, Henry was now becoming impatient, but Cromwell continued to make preparations and instigate a marriage treaty in his usual steadfast way. Henry loved women, but not just any woman. He mainly went for those that had been educated and carried themselves with sophistication. Unfortunately, Anne wasn't one of those. In fact, she had received no formal education at all, unless you include her card-playing skills and a well-heeled trait of sewing socks. But not to be too unkind, she was adept at reading and writing, even if that was only in German. Anne was looked upon as a gentle soul and one who was virtuous, the main reasoning behind her recommendation as a suitor to Henry. Charles de Marillac, the French ambassador, once proclaimed her as of middling beauty and of very assured and resolute countenance. Her fair hair hanging and her lovely face gave her a beauty that would appeal to the English court and general public. It was now down to Holbein to make his easel full of life and convey to Henry a picture that was fit for a king. Well, in this case, not just any king. The big day arrived in 1540. It was New Year's Eve and Henry, who was now overexcited to see this woman, jumped on his steed and travelled to Rochester Abbey. Some of Henry's courtiers had gone on ahead with Henry turning up in disguise later in the day. The following day, Henry would make his entrance. Eustace Chapuis, who was the Spanish ambassador to Henry's court, reported on the meeting. The king so went up into the chamber, where the said Lady Anne was looking out of a window to see the bull baiting which was going on in the courtyard. When suddenly he embraced and kissed her, and showed her a token which the king had sent her for New Year's gift, and she being abashed and not knowing who it was, thanked him, and so he spoke with her. But she regarded him little, but always looked out the window, and when the king saw that she took so little notice of his coming, he went into another chamber and took off his cloak and came in again in a coat of purple velvet. And when the lords and knights saw his grace, they did him reverence. Henry's first impressions were not pleasing, and Cromwell was probably thinking, well, she'll grow on you, but no she wouldn't. Henry said that this was not the woman portrayed in the image by Holbein, but it was all a little too much too late. On the 3rd of January, outside the gates to Greenwich Park, Henry finally met Anne officially. A sizeable grand reception was laid out to welcome her to court. Now at this point it is worth noting that many historians believe the arrangement between the two was so uninspiring due to Anne's appearance along with her failure to consummate the marriage 
as Henry clearly found her not suitable to be queen and he felt misled by his advisers to her beauty. Thomas Cromwell had to reluctantly accept a portion of the blame at this. He was the one who had instigated the whole affair and the hole he had dug himself was getting considerably deeper. Although Henry ordered Cromwell to find legal ways in stopping the marriage, this was going to be another stumbling block, more so due to the alliance which had been agreed with the Germans. Henry had tears in his eyes, not of joy, but anger, and Cromwell was now running scared, and the king was hot on his trail. Another royal wedding was now set, and it's entirely possible this would end up being one of the more embarrassing days for Henry. One can imagine the court were at loggerheads about celebrating, if a celebration was indeed the right thing to do. But that aside, the two of them were married on the 6th of January 1540 at the Palace of Placentia in Greenwich. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer had the front row seat and the words required to carry out the ceremony. On her arrival in England, Anne had conformed to the new religion. This at least put a wry smile on Henry's face. Apart from that, there was literally nothing he liked about her. I see Cromwell cowering in the corner. Let me go speak to him. He told Cromwell in no uncertain terms that they had not consummated the marriage and ended by stating, I liked her before not well, but now I like her much worse. February 1540, Anne was praising the king while speaking to the Countess of Rutland. She said that, when he comes to bed he kisseth me, and he taketh me by the hand, and biddeth me good night, sweetheart, and in the morning kisseth me and biddeth farewell, darling. Madam, there must be more than this, or it will be long ere we have a Duke of York, which all this realm most desireth. It would all end in tears for Anne, who was asked to leave court on the 24th of June. Henry had spoken, and his words were the usual defamatory way of saying goodbye. To be more factual, he had doubts about the marriage and that he could not believe she was a virgin. Anne was asked to agree to an annulment within a few days and quite possibly with a sigh of relief, she agreed. Thomas Cromwell wasn't so lucky, he was attained for treason. The marriage was officially annulled on 9th of July 1540 on the grounds of non-consummation and a pre-contract with Francis of Lorraine. Anne would now be placed away from court. She received a very generous settlement and quite possibly thanked for her time. But sarcasm aside, she received Richmond Palace and Hever Castle, home to the King's former wife, Anne Boleyn. Although there was never any love between the pair, Anne and Henry did go on to become great friends. Henry even made her an honorary member of the royal family. She was declared now as the King's beloved sister. Invitations to court would come thick and fast and quite possibly to give Henry a game of cards and have a few drinks. Henry also stipulated that she would be given precedence over all other women throughout his realm, except his own wife and daughters. Catherine Howard was the next wife for Henry, but after the tragic ending of this, her brother William Duke of Ulick Cleavesburg asked Henry to consider marrying Anne again, but Henry, once bitten and now twice shy, refused. For now, the sixth and final wife of the king would step forward, Catherine Parr. For some reason not really known, Anne seemed to dislike the new lady on the block, and she said, Madame Parr is taking a great burden on herself. After Henry died, his will had specific requests with regards to Anne. She was asked to move out of her home at Bletchingley Palace by Edward VI Privy Council, and this was to make way for Thomas Cowarden, Master of Revels. Penshurst would be her new home, and to look on the bright side, it was also nearer to Hever Castle. Later in the year of 1553, Anne had written a letter to Mary I, congratulating her on the marriage to Philip of Spain. It would be in September when Mary left St James's Palace for Whitehall. She was accompanied by both her sister Elizabeth and Anne, but this wasn't the only occasion that Anne found herself in the company of Mary. She also took part in Mary's coronation at Westminster Abbey. But this would be the last time Anne was given any role at a public gathering. Mary was of course a robust Catholic leader, and for Anne, this meant changing her religion again to comply with the new queen. This was all to no avail as Anne eventually found she was to be excluded from court. It all began when rumours surfaced that she was part of Wyatt's rebellion in 1554. Anne at the time held a close association with Elizabeth, Mary's sister. 
But this had convinced Mary that somehow Anne certainly had some input into the plot. Yet there was no evidence and it all seems highly contentious in the way Mary had gathered such information. For Anne, she was not invited back to court after this event and left to live a quiet existence on one of her estates. It's pretty sad to think that Anne never left England again. She became homesick at times and quite possibly wanted more than anything else to visit her relations back home. It is said she was content most of the time and was once described as a lady of commendable regards, courteous, gentle, a good housekeeper and very bountiful to her servants. Over time, Anne's health started to go downhill. Mary now allowed her to live at Chelsea, Old Manor, the exact destination as Henry VIII's last wife, Catherine Parr. It would be at the manor that Anne drew up her last will. She mentioned her family along with the future Queen of England, Elizabeth. Some monies were left to her servants and requests were sent to both Mary and Elizabeth to employ them after Anne's passing. And people who knew and were close to Anne said they all agreed that she was a generous lady and a perfect mistress. On the 16th of July, 1557, Anne died at Chelsea. It would be just eight weeks short of her 42nd birthday. Her funeral took place at Westminster Abbey on the 3rd of August. The epitaph is simple in its eloquence. Anne of Cleves, Queen of England, born 1515, died 1557. Anne of Cleves is another lady that led an extraordinary life within the Tudor period. She encompasses everything we today would expect of a lady of her standing. It seems looks were equally crucial in the 16th century for some as they are today for others. But we must look beyond the outer skin and inside you will find a lady that is quite possibly the most dignified, honest and caring person you could wish for. She was happy. It seems no matter what hardship lay ahead, she would just simply move with the times and react accordingly. The leadership skills also warrant a mention. It must have been most gratifying for members of her inner circle to attend such a lady. Non-judgmental, happy to assist and help where possible. She took a hands-on approach to life and created a stable and enduring backdrop to the hustle and bustle of the Tudor regime. Her attitude was to satisfy and encourage individuals to come forth and have no fear. These qualities have been admired. Anne of Cleves would always make the best of awkward situations. And yet even the mighty Henry had to eventually submit with a smile, which was a rare and uncommon sight for the court in England. Mm -hmm.